This is Hemant. And Jessica. And you're listening to the Friendly Atheist Podcast. Please go to patreon.com slash friendly atheist podcast to support this show. I want to give a special thank you to everyone in Denver who welcomed me over the weekend. Really oh, yeah. appreciate it. And it is almost our 500th episode. Sure and is. this Saturday, October 7th, in the western suburbs of Chicago, we are hosting a party. Mm-hmm. And what details do people need to know? Link, by the way, to anyone who wants that information is in the show notes. Oh, good. Yeah. So it's going to be at Salt North Brewery in Naperville, Illinois, not the Chicago one in Naperville. Um, we're going to have a few tables set aside. Um, and yeah, everybody's welcome to show up. I believe it is kid friendly. It's pet friendly. We'll have Dottie with us if you want to bring food. Uh, either from home or that you picked up. That would be fun. Um, Yeah, it's going to be great. I'm really excited. It's going to be kind of chilly. It's going to be like 60 degrees and sunny, which is where I thrive. Um, So just be prepared for that. It's going to be outside. There's a fire pit. I'm just really excited to like hang out and be relaxed and and chill. It'll be fun. So happy 500th almost to us. Yay. And then we just won't do anything special for the next episode because the party's more than enough. We should probably do so. Like, should we do like a... Have readers send in shit about... Sure, if you have yeah, shit to send that. in, send us messages Let and we'll read some ourselves. of them. Let us celebrate ourselves. We so often berate ourselves. It would be nice to feel positive It'll be about good my news contributions because all to this of, dumb world. All of this is horrible stuff. Oh, let's no. Let's start this week <laughs> with something called Project 2025. Yeah, you've heard of Project Blitz. No. The Christian Rights Playbook but to Change Laws, Revise an History. Election year. It's not. But basically, Project Blitz was like a playbook to promote an evangelical friendly future for the country. This is not that. True. This is actually something a little different, but it's it's along the same pathway. More or less insidious. More insidious. Oh, good. I was worried I would feel too good about things. Yeah. This is created, uh, Project Tw- 2025. It's created by the Right Wing Heritage Foundation. It is a 920-page document. That's what we call a manifesto. <laughs> yeah, that basically outlines their plan for what they hope will be a second Trump term or a first term for any other Republican president. Mm-hmm. And obviously, 2025, that's when they get sworn in. Right. And basically, this 920-page thing, it's a threat to anyone who doesn't believe in Jesus or that conservative extremists should control all of government. Oh, boy. And it's not Project Blitz. It's not religion specific, but there are aspects of it that talk about religion. Now, if you saw this in the news at all, one of the biggest things in here, it's like a Republican playbook for the future, Uh is that they would reinstate Schedule F. And that is a thing that basically would give the president the power to reclassify, then fire tens of thousands of career government employees. Basically, what guys? Uh, Under the guise of, I don't like you anymore. Like, there are so many people uh, in the government who work for the government who are just there for the long haul. Like the day-to-day. Day-to-day people. Yeah. And then the president, whoever that person is, gets to say, well, the head of this agency will be someone I like. I get to appoint them. And there are some positions in every agency that the president gets to pick. Right. That's not new. That's supposed to change with every administration. But the reason they can just change personnel like that is because there's way more people who are just there forever. Right. They don't like that in the government because that's what Republicans call the deep state and they're all (laughs) corrupt. And so reinstating Schedule F would allow the president to get rid of the career employees. It, It would break the engine that keeps the nation functioning which is everything Republicans love. Uh They like creating dysfunction, then blaming dysfunction on Democrats, even though they are the ones creating it. Uh Other things... Well, it's proving their own point that, see, government doesn't work when people like us get in business and undermine it. (laughs) Ha! Gotcha! And Project 2025 says we can get around Senate confirmations if we don't run the Senate because the president can just appoint acting heads of agencies, which Trump did after everyone quit his administration slowly. And you could do a lot of things. But let me talk about some of the religious aspects of this. Um, In the first few pages, the Heritage Foundation's president, his name is Kevin Roberts, he says, today, the left is threatening the tax-exempt status of churches and charities that reject woke progressivism. I mean, he's not wrong. They we will soon are. they will soon turn to Christian schools and clubs with the same totalitarian intent. 
to be clear, all of that is a lie. No one is threatening the tax-exempt status of churches and oh, charities. I am. No, you are not, because you have no power well, to do you, it, I'm and you loud. wouldn't be able to. That's all you got. Uh, so, like, that. that's the thing. Church-state separation groups are not calling for churches to lose their tax-exempt statuses. And I've said this before, but if you wanted to get rid of the tax-exempt status of churches, what you're basically saying is all nonprofits right. should lose their tax-exempt status. That's right. a horrible idea. But... What they have talked about is if there is a church that endorses a candidate from the pulpit and violates the rules of nonprofits, mm-hmm. then yeah, they are not playing by the rules. They should lose their tax exempt status, but that is not church specific. Mm-hmm. That's you broke the rules, so you should get punished right. specific. So, right off the bat, these people are lying. Here's another instance in the document it claims the Biden administration, this is a direct quote. The Biden administration has been hostile to people of faith, especially those with traditional beliefs about marriage, gender, and sexuality. Which, again, if you're calling that hostility, the Biden administration opposes discrimination and bigotry. Mm -hmm. They are not opposed to people of faith. Mm. Did you know Biden is a person of faith? think you're lying because I think uh, they made up Catholicism to scare Baptists. Yeah. I mean, the fact that Project 2025 conflates the two, yeah. like you hate people of faith, Biden people. It's like, no, they are people of faith. They're opposed to using your religion as an excuse to override non-discrimination rules. It's like they're not being intellectually honest in their arguments. Yeah. I know. That's the frustrating thing about reading any of these documents from right-wing groups. It's like, do I know you're lying about this stuff? Do you know you're I'm, lying about this stuff? That is, and I know I harp on it all the time. It really makes me crazy too because it it means you can't have a real conversation with somebody because you're having a conversation with sort of like this robot who won't accept certain terms and like yeah. just rejects shit out you of You can't have end. a debate if you can't agree on what's facts. Well, and and as we've said and I am not the first to say this, you can't reason somebody out of a position they didn't reason themselves right. into. Fair. So another aspect of Project 25 talks about how the uh, how they plan to attack the education system. Uh-huh. Okay, this is from uh, the Freedom From Religion Foundation's Action Fund, their lobbying arm. They described it this way. Project 2025 calls for mandatory religious exemptions from accreditation standards and criteria for private schools. So the ways we can say, yeah, they are teaching kids what they need to teach... This document says, yeah, but if you're a religious school, you should be able to get out of that. No standards can apply to you in that stuff. I wonder how they, what they have to say about the uh, Hasidic Jewish school up in New York that got busted because they like weren't teaching their students math. It wasn't one school. It's a lot of schools in. And are they modeling? Are they modeling their shit off of that? I wonder, or are they using that some kind? Because that's the only other. I think their argument is, if it's a religious school, they can do whatever the fuck they want. They can do whatever they want, and if you fail to meet accreditation standards set by the government, you can still just claim accreditation anyway, because the government wouldn't be in the business of saying, yeah, okay, even if you're a faith based school. Uh, you are doing what you need to do at a bare minimum, and then we don't care what your religious views are. And I think we get so far afield of thinking about what's actually good for children. Oh, yeah. Here's that aspect. Oh. Here's one aspect of that. The document says no public institution could ever require a teacher or professor to use a trans student's pronouns Why if it goes against the teacher's this? religious beliefs. Jesus Fucking cr- How often is this happening to people? <laughs> These people couldn't tell you what a pronoun was like a year ago, and now they're like, nope, this is the hill we're dying I just on. Don't, it, it's so infuriating because it's like, dude, my dude, this is not happening at your school. Like, And even if it was, that's a good thing, but that's neither here nor They're like... What are they fucking do? Why do they need to make up these like gremlins? Because there's no actual discrimination against Christians. They have it better than every other religious Why group. Why do they want to be oppressed? They want to pretend to be oppressed. One, it's good for fundraising. Two, it yeah. makes them feel like, yes, we are being oppressed. We're therefore, our religion based. is going to bind us together and we must fight against the world that's out to get us. And if the reality is, no, no one's out to get you. You have it better than everyone else. It's like, 
Well, then I don't have to go to church, I guess, because yeah. I'm doing just fine. And like if people are out to get you, maybe look internally, because guess what? <laughs> the government was out to get Jonestown. And honestly, that was probably a good move on the government's <laughs> part, wouldn't you say? Otherwise, maybe that good, congressman good wouldn't have been then. shot on, way, on his yeah. way to get back. No, but truly, like this is they act like any government interference, interference is necessarily bad and horrible and, and are allowing themselves and their constituents to paint the... Uh, the government as a boogeyman, which somehow does not include police, but I, that's neither here nor there. They're not part of the government. Right. They thin blue line and all that. I don't know. They, they, they just don't care to look at reality and see what's actually going on. And well, that's and the Republican care party for about you. what, and again, care about what's actually best for their kids. Because guess what? You send a kid off into the world, not knowing how babies are made. Have you seen spring awakening? It's what it's about. I believe it. So let's talk about sex discrimination then. So one of the things the Obama administration did, uh, there are Title IX rules by the government, gender equity rules that public institutions have to play by. Mm -hmm. Well, the Obama administration allowed colleges to request religious exemptions to Title IX rules, which prohibits discrimination on the basis of sex. Mm -hmm. The list of schools that got exemptions were made public. So okay. you could always see, like, these schools requested that they don't have to follow Title IX rules. They were granted that for and, religious reasons. And what, could you give me an example of why um, that Off the top of my head. Is uh, it, like, sports-based? Like, we it don't, could be. It's an all-boys school, so we don't have to offer whatever, or... You, That's, no you know what? It's a fair question, and I don't have it in okay. front of me, so I don't want to make something up. Okay. Um, but those list of schools that got exemptions were made public. Project 2025 says you got to hide that, quote, list of shame from the public view, which would make it harder for Americans to what? see which schools are promoting faith-based sex discrimination. So they're like, no, we want an exemption to, like, but when we it want comes to do to, it in secret. And we want to do it in secret because we don't want people knowing we're doing it. These are just toddlers who have decided they want to do whatever they want, and mommy can't tell me what yes. to do. That is what I'm listening to. That's right correct. Now. They also want to funnel federal grant money oh, to Bible based groups that oppose marriage equality and trans identities. They want to reward groups that say marriage is between, quote, I love this quote, no. one man and one unrelated woman. They had to clarify. Oh, that's so embarrassing. Oh, yeah. my God. That's so... Guys, you just showed your card so hard. Because <laughs> uh, you know what it is actually bad for children? Incest. Yes. So. They're basically saying there are... I mean, religious groups do get access to grant money, federal grant money. Yeah. And uh, they're saying uh, we should them. receive it even if we openly discriminate on the basis of faith. Because you can't tell me what to do, Mom. Mm-hmm. And Mom, they I'm say now. Uh, people who get these grants uh, should be available. The grant should be available to faith based recipients who affirm that marriage is between not just any two adults, but one man and one unrelated woman. Unrelated woman. Uh -huh. It's so embarrassing. Yeah. They also How, condemn. I, what would you give to be a fly in the wall for the conversation that required that <laughs> to be added? Like, guys, 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 we have to add unrelated because they're going to get us. In the South. Oh, my yeah. God. Yeah. The document also condemns any, quote, pressure to conform to non-religious definitions of marriage and family, presumably because those definitions treat gay people as people. Yeah, fuck them. So the conservatives who wrote this thing, they also don't want to see wages increase for workers across the board, oh, of good. course. But they also believe that anyone who works on the Sabbath should be eligible for overtime pay. Like the goal is to pressure employers to like simply not be open on Sundays. Why do they care, Hemant? Because they're basically saying That's like not free market capitalism then. Congress should require that workers be paid time and a half. For hours worked on the Sabbath. And that's supposed to be their idea of saying, see, we are pro-worker. What it would actually do is for a lot of employers, they would say, you know what? We're just going to not Close. be open on Sundays. And that's kind of what they're trying to do here. Or it's going to... This is so okay. fucking stupid. Other stuff. FFRF Action Fund also pointed out the only mentions of Islam, for example, if this is all about God-given mm -hmm. rights and mm -hmm. all that stuff... The only mentions of Islam in the 920-page publication 
are referenced are references to Islamic terrorism and concerns over the Islamic Republic of Iran's nuclear capabilities. Oh, sure. We're always in church talking about Iran's nuclear capabilities. Yep. Thanks, they, dude. It also says religious devotion and spirituality are the greatest sources of happiness around the world. No citation provided. That guy's that. never hugged a horse. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best feeling in the yeah. world. The, hug size. There are other policy changes that would open the door to religious companies getting loans from the Small Business Administration. It endorses religious pharmacists who don't want to provide contraception to patients. It supports religious bigots who run adoption and foster care agencies with taxpayer dollars but don't want to work with gay couples. It gives faith-based anti-vaxxers a way to spread diseases in the name of Jesus. Um, and there's a whole nother section of the document written by an anti-LGBTQ activist, Roger Severino, where he dismisses the CDC precautions taken during COVID to prevent mass gatherings in order to slow the spread of the virus. Mm -hmm. um, it says, for example, how much risk mitigation is worth the price of shutting down churches on the holiest day of the Christian calendar and far beyond, as happened in 2020? What's the proper balance of lives saved versus souls saved? So this guy's uh, uh, point of view is that God is going to send people to hell for missing Sundays for a year in church? In church, in person. I mean, granted, in person, in you church, could do it and online. God, and God is like, mm, hell. Yeah. That's a cool yeah. God. He, That's first a of all, God that I want to be a part Severino of. Severino makes it sound like Christians were the only people who suffered during the pandemic. And oh, that going no, none to, of us did. No, no one else. Atheists and that, had a grand old time during the <laughs> pando. And that going to in-person services on Easter, let's say, was worth the cost of spreading a virus that has taken, I checked this out, how many lives has COVID taken so far? Estimated, because we don't have actual numbers. 1.2 million. 6.7 million worldwide. Fuck. Oh, worldwide. Worldwide. Wow. He also believes the CDC's policy was not pro-health. It was just anti-Christian. And that any science-based recommendations that inconvenience Christians should be tossed aside. Because his mythological beliefs ought to override public health. Like, the government should not be in the business of worrying about your eternal soul. Not the job of the government. And it's absolutely buck wild that they think that this should be part of the government's concern. Like, we can barely keep human beings alive in this country. I don't think we need to put people's souls on our radar. That feels like maybe a private sector thing. Yeah, really. Um, the people who are behind Project 2025, they have a $22 million budget By to way, work with. By the such a short-sighted plan. It's almost 2023. They're going to whip this thing together in, what, 13 months? Well, it does. they're just saying the problem that they're trying to tackle is that when Trump got elected in 2016... He was a bad president and everyone too. died. It came as a surprise even to conservatives who were not expecting it. And that meant they were like, it took they them a while a before he was even inaugurated. It's not like they had a list of people ready to stick in government roles because sure. no one thought he was going to win. Right. And so by the time they got around to doing it, of course, as we know, because Trump just constantly complained, he hires the best people and then he hates all those people. Yeah. But they were like, okay, this time, if a Republican gets elected, we're just saying, here's what we're going to do. Here are the 900 executive orders. Mm -hmm. We're going to file right away, and all the guide has to do is sign it or whatever. Um, so they have a $22 million budget. They have an advisory board full of right-wing organizations with a long history of harming marginalized groups, lying about American history, filing lawsuits against civil rights protections, banning books, etc. This is not just one crazy dude or one extremist organization, there are dozens and dozens of right-wing organizations that have basically signed off mm -hmm. on this Project 2025. And it, I mean, why did they issue it now? Because it's meant to convince the Republican base that they need to fall in line and vote for whoever the presidential nominee is, even if it's Donald Trump, which it probably will be, no matter if he's convicted of his many, many crimes or whatever. But really, it should serve as a warning for, like, sane people about what is at stake in the next election if they don't vote for the Democrat or pretend to have some principled reason mm -hmm. for either sitting out the election or voting for some third-party candidate. That's what it should do. There are plenty of dumb people who won't vote for the Democrat for some reason or another, but this is what's going to happen if you don't do that. Yeah. It's going to be way scarier than what happened under Trump. Uh, so this is what's awaiting us if the, Repul uh, if the Republican Party wins next cool. year. Yeah. 
They are telling us what their plans are, and it should scare people. Huh. Let's talk about... I actually watched a show this week, what? and I don't want to wait for the bonus episode to talk about it because I felt it was relevant to this. Can I talk about some of my bonus episode nope. shit? God nothing. No, the show just aired last week, I believe, on uh, HBO, and it's online now, but it's called Savior Complex. And we actually talked about this, the woman who is at the center of this. It's a three-episode, one-hour-long episodes. Mm-hmm. It's a three-episode miniseries, docu-series, and it's about a woman named Renee Bach. And we talked about her years ago. I don't know if you remember this. I will no. give you the recap. But basically, when Renee Bach turned 19, she was homeschooled. She lived in Virginia, mm-hmm. very Christian. She's like, I want to go to Uganda to help the malnourished children. Mm-hmm. And she went there, I mean, did that right sort of mission. you're right, There's some people who need your help there. but <laughs> There too. But she went to Uganda. She actually formed a nonprofit called Serving His Children. Okay. His, his children, God's children. Capital H. Uh-huh. She got a lot of money from her church in order to help uh, start the nonprofit and stuff. And it covered a lot of the medicine and supplies that a hospital, I mean, might need to help malnourished kids. So that right. sounds all well and good. Like, all right, if you're going there and you're actually helping and doing something, I mean, that's better than just... Touring around and pretending right. and building Taking a church. Taking pictures with black kids. Yes. I mean, like, see? <laughs> yes. And so here's the problem, though. She has no formal medical training, but what we found out really quickly, because she's documenting everything online and raising money for her nonprofit, uh-huh. is, hey, you seem to be performing medical procedures no. on these kids. No. Yeah. And yeah, she had a nurse on staff for a lot of this, and eventually they hired other medical professionals, but she very much was doing things you would expect a doctor or a nurse to be doing. She is injecting IVs. Whoa. She is doing other... Uh, this is actually what uh, one person wrote. A gardener who worked there for three years asserted that Bach posed as a doctor. She dressed in a clinical coat, no. often had a stethoscope around her neck. I, On a daily basis, I would see her medicating children. An American nurse who volunteered there, more on her later, said Bach felt God would tell her what to do for a child. Oh, no. And then here's the damning thing. Uh, oh, excuse me? I That's know, we're not there up? yet. Um, a Ugandan driver says that for eight years, quote, on average, I would drive at least seven to ten dead bodies of children back to their villages each week. That's where the docuseries comes in. This woman, oh Renee God. Bach, would insert IVs into children. She would prescribe medication. She performed at least one blood transfusion. Blood transfusion? Yeah. And the thing is, there are some, some aspects of medical care that any idiot can learn how to do. Uh-huh. But to have a layperson do all oh, of that and be stuff. be in charge of the program. Yeah, that's highly unethical. It creates tons of problems, obviously, when things don't go as expected. Like death, you mean? Those, yeah. those kinds of problems? And even in emergency situations, attempting to do that stuff yourself could make the problem worse. Mm-hmm. And the thing is, there were they quoted an actual doctor in the series who is in Uganda. He's like, she's getting money to get all this equipment and medicine and all that stuff. It's like, we don't have that kind of, those resources and so it's like, wow. if you gave us those resources, we have the knowledge to go along with it. Right. But So basically, this is all old news if you followed Renee Bach's story. Uh-huh. As the headlines kind of said years ago, 105 children died under Jesus her group's watch. Christ. And this raised a ton of question about uh, what culpability does she have in all this? Uh-huh. The argument her uh, Renee Bach and her side basically made is our success rates, our death rates, were actually lower than what you saw in the nearby hospital. Is that true? That is true according to the best evidence that we could find. Does However, that take into account the kinds of illnesses are being no, treated it at each? Ah. So that's the thing. If you're going to a hospital, those kids are probably on the verge of death. Mm. And that's a difference between the malnourished but not quite there yet kids who may be going to Renee's Listen, nonprofit. If group. I die after getting a flu shot versus dying after getting major surgery, I would not link those two right. things. Here is here is what we learned from the docu series, but we also knew this ahead of time. Okay. Bach and her team, including her mother, argue that 105 children died at saving her. Uh, saving his children with a mortality rate of 11%. Over the same period, the nearby children's hospital had a mortality rate of 14%. But 
those numbers just don't tell the whole story, which is what you just said. Mm. If Bach had listened more than acted, could her number have been under 10%? Like, aren't those lives valuable? And if she hadn't been there, could the yeah, number the have been question. worse? Could, could Would it have been worse if she wasn't there? And the truth is, there's no real solid answer to any of this, but this is her defense. She's like, look, there are way too many kids. The hospital is not helping them. I'm stepping in to help out. We are trying to hire more people, but at the same time, there are pictures of her like they look like she's in the surgery room sticking something in a kid's head. And her defense is, well, you're looking at a close-up of the picture. There's a doctor behind me. I don't care if the doctor is behind you. Where are the doctor's hands and why aren't they doing the thing? I should say in 2019. Why is the doctor letting her perform surgery if there's a doctor behind her? That was a very good question. Thank you. In 2019, two mothers whose kids died... Because, they say, because of her, Mm. they sued Bach for misrepresenting herself and her clinic as a legitimate medical uh, facility Mm. stocked with properly trained staff. Um, I won't tell you how that one ended, but the story, Savior Complex, the, the thing you saw on HBO... Because this story appears to have come to its logical end a couple years ago... Um, they had remarkable access. Renee Bach is the narrator, kind of, for the entire series. Not, And I don't mean that in a, they let her dictate the story. Okay. She didn't. But she definitely sat for all these interviews. Really? Yep. They also spoke with another Christian missionary who was also very young at the time, who said, I learned about what she was doing in Uganda, and I had just graduated, and I was a nurse. And I'm like, yes, that's what God is calling me to do, to go mm-hmm. work there. And she's, I feel like she's the only one who came off as like, I like this one. Yeah. Like, I, she was I, really trying to do a good thing. She was trying to do a good thing. I don't agree with the reasons, but I like what she's trying to do there. And when she went there, like she only lasted a couple of months. Really? Because uh, be- that bad. Because she joined uh, Renee Bach in Uganda in 2011. Her name was Jackie uh, Kramlick. But basically, she was a registered nurse. And when she got there, she's like, oh, shit. Like, this is pretty messed up what you're doing here. She's the only one who filed an affidavit against Renee Bach uh, saying that sometimes Bach would tell the professionals what to do. She left, uh, Jackie left after four months writing a resignation letter to the group's board of directors saying, like, you guys got to fix this because this is a problem. Whistleblower. Yeah, but the board is like, box friends and mother (laughs) so like it's like churches that never hold their pastors accountable because all the elders are his buddies right 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 right. um so like kudos to jackie she's the one who came off like i like you you're trying to do the right thing you realize how messed up this is and i forgive all the other problems that led you there (laughs) and here's the other thing that i enjoyed in a wow this is a sad story but also yes Mm. drama give me popcorn aspect There is a group called No White Saviors that popped up. And really, they popped up as a, we don't need white people coming to Africa to try to save the world here. Um, And it includes people from Uganda. clean up your own house, America. Yes, and one white woman from America who decided at some point, unrelated to Renee Bach, she went there too, thought she was helping, thought she was doing the right thing, and realized, got educated pretty quickly, like, you're not actually helping us. Mm. So she helped found this organization as well. And they really quickly latch on to the Renee story and start posting, (sighs) not uh, meme is the wrong word for it, but graphics online saying like, look at what she's doing. Like infographics or just images of what's happening? Both. Trying to say like, this is messed up. She would echo a lot of our positions that we're talking about here, Mm -hmm. but they would make it look really good and like infuriate you and you would spread it online. And they're really good at social media. And it worked. It totally, I mean, wow. the, their nonprofit also raised money, but also they're the ones who were, they acted like Rene Bach was the devil, leading to a lot of exaggerations about what was happening sure. at her place and a very one sided view of what was happening. Even right now, as we're discussing this, uh-huh. we have talked about some nuance that a lot of those kids who ended up at Renee's facility, they might have died already. They were not in great shape. Sure. And also she had equipment that the hospitals didn't have. Sure. And she had some medical professionals on staff. But again, she That's wasn't some a nuance, doctor. So but she's not a, a doctor shit. and all that stuff. You weren't going to hear that nuance from this other group, No White Saviors. Got you. And the idea, uh, this is what was written in Slate in a review of the docuseries. The idea that 
one of the founders of No White Saviors couldn't possibly have done something good without documenting it on social media. Like, they were so arrogant in saying, we are helping the black people for real by trashing No White Saviors? No no White Saviors. Okay. Like, they were in a unable to say anything nice about anything Renee was doing Uh because she was doing some good. The question Uh is, all the bad stuff she did, could it have been prevented? Um, They couldn't, the No White Saviors group couldn't do something good without documenting it on social media. Um, And that was something Renee was also doing. Like, I am saving this child right here. Uh Look at me injecting it with an IV, the child. And like, you're causing a lot of your own problems. And also some of these parents are like we didn't know you weren't a doctor so they're all playing the social media one-upsmanship game and like none of these people come out looking great none of them except for jackie that other nurse she looked great the entire time justice for jackie (laughs) right um i will say i've covered this for many years i knew large parts of the story but also seeing them tell the story from their perspective there is a point where I, what was the word? Like it was either malpractice or something like that. Fraud? Uh, something like that where the director, the producer was like talking to Renee and said, you know, what do you think about this thing that is going on? And she hit like, she couldn't even say what they were talking about. It's like, well, we were talking about malpractice. <laughs> we were talking about uh, this very serious allegation against you. And she's like, I don't just really? didn't even so, know what they were talking I'm about. I'm very excited about this because my favorite genre of documentary is when the star doesn't realize he's the villain of his own story. Yeah, there was a lot of that. I truly, the Schadenfreude, I get the Woodstock 99 documentary is great for that. The thing with the guy in Christmas and he fucks up his South Dakota neighborhood because he wants to be... It's like no idea Christmas what dude. we're talking about. He like does a huge display of Christmas every year and like thousands of people come in a day and his neighbors were like, could you not? And he's like, you guys hate Christmas. Of course. Yeah. The guy, the Firefest guy had one. Oh, it's so it, fun to watch people. Renee think got that treatment in the room. I mean, she had to volunteer for the story. I don't know if she got paid for it, which is a she weird ha- thing, but also to? she did. She gave her side of the story, but she didn't come out looking right. So did one the white lady involved in No White Saviors uh, also got interviewed. And you know she thinks she's like oh, saving yeah. the world, but she doesn't come off looking very good. She comes off as looking like, you know, activists who are on a mission and you might agree with them in principle. The Michael Moore syndrome. Yeah, but then they do things that you're like, oh, that's making Is me that cringe. Or not? It's like that yeah. when they had that big statue of, Trump with the tiny dick and like the big gut. It's like, <laughs> listen, this isn't helpful. Tiny right. dicks are not in- indicative of a person's quality. It's of- like if you're making fun of Trump's weight. Yeah, I get the appeal, but also that's not the problem I have with the guy. Yeah, and I have fat friends, and I don't. Really, yeah, I don't think that's a bad thing. You know what so, I mean? Like it's. <sighs> so all these people got interviewed. I mean, there were some doctors fat in friends. What an asshole! I just. There's uh, <laughs> doctors in Uganda who were interviewed for this story. They came off looking like totally sensible here, right. saying, look, we want to help kids. We have the material, the tools to help them. We know what they're suffering from because we have experience with it. Right. But we don't have the tools and equipment. Why aren't these churches giving it to places like us yeah. with the knowledge that with would actually go further? Doctors who have medical degree. I yeah. mean, it, it's just really frustrating because like, I was just listening to Sawbones and... Um, Sydney Macro as a, as a family physician was just talking about how much continuing CME, they call it continuing medical education they have to do to keep, to keep their certification up. And, and it's just like, this isn't just you throw on a white coat and give some people shots. Like there's actual shit you have to know and learn and, and be okay being wrong about and listen to people who know more than you. And it does sound like, does not sound like, this person has that uh, ability, frankly. Yeah. um, One thing, I'm not giving away any spoilers here. The reason they're able to talk to Renee Bach about this series is because she's not in jail. She never really faced any consequences for Mm. anything she did, no matter how hard some people tried. Yeah. Um, And she seems like removed physically from all the chaos and misery she caused. Oh, yeah. And so there is an open question of like, did you learn a lesson? Did like how what would you have done differently? No, I don't gonna, know. She's gonna phoenix herself and become <laughs> a wellness guru in about five years. Mark my words. Mark it time. my words. I will say I twenty twenty eight. I so appreciate the fact that a series like this one and Prime Videos, Shiny Happy People about the Duggars mm. and their religion, 
they're now reaching mainstream audiences. Mm-hmm. It's not just people like us talking about this stuff and using it. We're not mainstream. We're so not. <laughs> um, but the fact that these things are going out there and it's like, yeah, this is disturbing. You can't watch this series and come away thinking, you know what? Mission trips are always good. Um, there is that thing of like voluntourism yeah. and the white savior idea. That's why it's called savior complex because mm-hmm. that... That is a term she heard over and over during the whole time. She had her blog up and she was writing about these things and sharing the stories. Savior complex. And so, I mean, I... I mean, and I get where it's coming from. Like, if I want to travel... Like, I get that instinct of, like, if I want to travel and I want to see some part of the world, I also want to feel like I'm doing good. But the And the problem with the mission trips is that their idea of what good looks like is not necessarily what the people in those countries need. It's not what they want. And just because you saved them with the gospel, I promise you, you haven't actually made their lives any better. Right. Um, So it's I like that it's reaching bigger audiences, that Mm -hmm. faith based criticism is just fair game for these documentaries that are so abundant on Netflix and Hulu and everywhere else. Yeah, and I really, truly, the shiny happy people thing coming out was huge, especially in this area. I don't know if you talked to anybody who found out that the headquarters are like in Hinsdale (laughs) and shiny happy people. Like, I drove drove by there pretty frequently and it's creepy. But, like, I don't know, this idea of. Because people have always known the Duggars, especially, and people have always known white saviors. And to finally, like, be in a in a societal position to be like, "Hey, gang, this sucks." There is an, uh, a Ugandan attorney who represented the two Ugandan mothers who lost their kids oh. in that lawsuit. She is also featured in the documentary. Oh, and she was, comes off real good. She does come off looking good. I mean, there's only so much she can do when she's right. trying. But one of the things she points out uh, that I appreciated, she's like, "There is a larger principle at stake." Imagine if a 20-something Ugandan woman had Mm -hmm. gone to the U.S. Mm -hmm. and set up an equivalent arrangement to treat impoverished American children Mm -hmm. and then killed 105 of them. Mm -hmm. She would have been prosecuted. She would have been behind bars. Mm -hmm. In the U.S., I don't think she would have lasted two hours. Mm -hmm. Fair point. It's very fair. And yet, when Renee goes over there, it's like, all right, well, is she going to get in trouble for all these murders? All these kids who are dying in her care if not physically even if she's not there it's her organization how much responsibility and this is an open question how much responsibility does she own for the deaths of those kids because again it could fairly be said some of them would have died anyway sure that some of them would have died in a hospital Mm -hmm. that she was able to prolong that or help them out uh, other kids but how many of those people was she responsible for the way we decide if she's doing good or not isn't by her telling us it's by documentation and Mm -hmm. and having somebody looking over her shoulder and making sure she's you know doing good medicine and evidence-based shit like it's you it's just so frustrating that people just think that because they have good in their heart that they are free from consequences from any damage they might have done it's extremely disturbing And with that in mind, let's talk about Liberty University, because this is a kind of bombshell report in the New York, uh, in the Washington Post about what happened. Basically, schools that receive any federal funding uh, of any sort, student loans, grants, things like that, uh, colleges that get any federal financial aid have to disclose with the government crime statistics and anything else about campus safety. And if there's any concerns about what they're doing, they may face a program review. So like just general statistics of, okay. And Liberty Liberty University got in 2020 and 2021, the most recent information that's available, Liberty University got $874 million from the U.S. government for student loans and grants. And that has nothing to do with religion. That's just an uh, institute of higher education. Mm -hmm. That students are like, I want to get a student loan from the government. Why? So I can go to Liberty. All right, fine. You're going to pay back your loan at some point or whatever. So the government gives it. That's fine. But because Liberty takes that money, $874 million in one year, they have to follow this rule of reporting safety information. Uh Okay, it's called the Clary Act. What just happened is that if the government says you're not compliant with your Clary Act obligations, Uh we may have to investigate you. Uh And uh, like a year or two ago, Liberty University acknowledged, yeah, we are being investigated over noncompliance. 
Um, just you, to acknowledge it. Could you give me like some kind of example of oh, what I'll sort of... Oh, I'll give you many. Th- oh, okay, thank you. I will I, give I'm you many. Little, I'm feeling a little unmoored about what we're talking about. Yeah. Here. Basically, the are you reporting crimes that occur on campus? Things like that. Uh-huh. That's what the school's obliged to do right. if they're getting any federal funds. Well, the Washington Post got a hold of the preliminary findings from the education department now that they're investigation is over of Liberty University, uh or at least the initial investigation is over. And what it finds, I'm going to read this. It paints a picture of a university that discouraged people from reporting crimes, underreported the claims it received, and meanwhile marketed its Virginia campus as one of the safest in the country. Wow. Liberty. Really? Liberty failed. I'm still quoting the Washington Post. Liberty failed to warn the campus community about gas leaks, (gasps) <gasps> bomb threats, and people credibly accused of repeated acts of sexual violence, including a senior administrator no. and an athlete. No. Like, those are things the school is supposed to let students know about because, hey, your safety is in danger. I don't know why right the now. gas leak thing seems the most. Like, who are you protecting well, from right? the gas leak? Yeah. And the draft also contends that officials at Liberty destroyed evidence no. after a government inquiry began. Wow, yeah. shredding party. One campus safety consultant uh, who saw the Washington Post, uh, an early copy of it, uh-huh. said, this is the single most blistering Clary report I have ever read, ever. Wow. Yeah. And one of, I mean, some of these things, the report cites a Liberty University Police Department incident report that the school did not enter into the daily crime log. Sure. Quote, an alleged rape that was committed by a former Liberty president. What? Well, guess what? At the time that happened, there were only two former Liberty presidents alive. One of them was Jerry Falwell Jr. <gasps> and the other was a guy named John Borek, who's on the university's board. Jerry Falwell Jr. absolutely responded to the Washington Post's request for comment. It was absolutely not an allegation about me. I've never, I never heard anything about it, and it had nothing to do with me. That feels like a lie. <laughs> and the other guy just didn't respond to a request for comment. Which is the correct thing to have Which, done. Mm-hmm, students and others, I mean, the, this isn't funny. Liberty University it's, is famous for having an honor code and like a, a rule book for students that's their honor code. That basically says, like, you can't do anything. You can't be in rooms with someone of mm-hmm. the opposite gender or something like that. Yeah. Because basically they're very conservative. Putting themselves off as we do everything by the book, so nothing very bad happens. Religious, you don't have any bad thoughts. Very conservative. No drinking, no sex outside of marriage. Which is how I know it's not happening there. Yeah. If the rule is. Everyone yeah. follows the rules all the all time. All the time, including the presidents. And yet, and yet, the students are complaining that the university used its honor code, and this is a long-standing oh, problem, to, shit, dis- to discourage people from reporting sexual assault. Because sure if you did. go to Un- Liberty University and say, I was sexually assaulted, mm-hmm. that might lead to a question about, like, well, how did you and that other person be... Were you in his in- dorm room? Right. Why were you in his dorm room in the first place? And Sounds so- like your fault, Kurt. Sorry, yeah, I'm so yeah, mad. That's I'm where it's angry. going from. That's where it's going. And that's the thing. That has been a long time criticism of the Liberty Way, their rule book. Basically saying, I can't report sexual assault here because if I do, I'm admitting that I had a guy in my room. Or I, I was willing to have sex, but he took it too far. And when I said no, he didn't stop because you're still admitting you were trying to have sex. Mm. And so they just don't report it at all. And now we're finding out, oh, the university, even when they do get those reports, they're not publicizing them in the way they need to. It's Here's, almost like people don't care about women. Oh, I know. Shocking. Huh. Um, Weird. This is also from The Post. In 2016, the school did issue an emergency notification about a bomb threat, the report says. Mm. But senior officials were concerned, and at least one campus police officer quote, was subjected to a disciplinary action for issuing the notice, even though it was issued in conformity with federal law and the institution's published policy at the time. So one campus police officer did what he was supposed to do and said, hey, everyone, there was a bomb threat on campus. And they they reprimanded that dude because it's like, dude, if the public finds out there's a bomb threat here, we can't call it a safe campus, maybe. And so they got mad at him for doing his job. Is this like when in Disney World, if somebody dies, they like rush them off property so they can <laughs> say nobody's ever died here? That's yeah. what this feels like that's to me. <laughs> the idea. Um, this is the other story, uh, not the 
the president who allegedly did something. Um, A prominent Liberty athlete was also accused of raping a woman in 2020, but the school did not issue a timely warning to the campus or report the incident in its crime statistics, according to the Education Department investigators. A Liberty student said he stalked her in early 2021. The school issued a no-contact directive in August of 2022. Police arrested him the following month, but guess what? He continued to play for the team, according to the report, even after he was found guilty of stalking. I have to assume this is football. Yeah. Um, The Lynchburg Circuit Court later overturned that ruling, citing insufficient proof under the law. Sure. The report noted, but the athlete's actions did undoubtedly fall under the Clary Act definition of stalking, which means Mm -hmm. the school had to report that even if it wasn't a quote-unquote crime under state law or something like that. So this is the idea. Like, all <laughs> this is another one. Although the education department told Liberty in 2022, when it notified the school of the review, like, hey, you, it looks like you're doing some wrong stuff. We're going to investigate. They said preserve information that could be relevant. But according to the report, senior officials in HR sought the Shredded assistance party. of IT staff to wipe certain computer hard drives yep. on April 26, 2022, the very week that the review team first visited the campus. Wow, I can't believe it. What a weird coincidence that they very happened weird. to do their semi-annual paper shredding thing the day of uh, the day of the thing. Yeah. Wow. Cool. These guys really sound like they're above board and believe that Always. what they're doing is right and good. Um, because it's for God and they're not covering anything up because that would be wrongdoing. But what they are doing is good work for God Mm -hmm. and country. That is by shredding evidence of people being it should be said campus in 2019, just like Jesus would. In 2019, the education department levied its largest Clary Act violation fine of 4.5 million dollars against Michigan State University really? because they weren't doing this stuff either. But that was, in, not but, like that was involving Larry Nasser, the sports doctor, sure. who was accused of all the sexual violence yeah. I, and found guilty, I believe, correct? Uh-huh. Um, like that involved him. And the school said, you weren't reporting all this stuff he was doing, that the government said that, and mm-hmm. they had to pay a $4.5 million fine. So now the question is, okay, well, they found all this stuff that Liberty University is allegedly doing or not doing. Uh-huh. Are they going to take action? Like, Liberty has a chance now to respond, to refute any of these allegations, and that's where they or are show in the how process. they're putting a better foot forward in the yes. future, admitting their mistakes. Yeah, but they would have still violated in the past, even if you fixed oh, it. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay, yeah, So yeah. they can say, like, no, you said we did this, but that's gotcha. not accurate. Okay. They have a t- they have a chance to do that now, and they did issue a statement saying, like, well, some of this is overblown, and we have done this stuff, sure. but, but. but we'll see. Um, I, I hope the government doesn't, like, let them off the hook because it's a religious campus. Uh, we will see. Um, what is, so what is worst case scenario for Liberty? I don't Liberty? know. I don't know because what the worst case scenario is. even if they have a $4.5 million dollar fine, that is That's a nothing. drop in the bucket to the, what did you say, almost billion dollars a, that they get from the government? What? Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know if that I mean, means the federal government's going to say you can get a student loan, but you can't get it if you're going to Liberty because they aren't following our rules. Yeah, we I'm, know the government doesn't go after churches that violate the rules. Yeah. We've talked about that. So I don't know what they're going to do. I mean, but I feel like it being under the umbrella of university is going to change things because because churches are such a, like, stand on their own thing. There's really not much, I, I guess, um, like, nonprofits you can compare it to, but not really whereas this is under a very clear umbrella of like collegiate law right mm-hmm. like it has they have to do something about this um i should say liberty posted a statement after the washington post article went up saying it has hired two law firms to review its clary act compliance and respond to the education department the school said that earlier this year, uh, the school's response earlier this year, according to the statement, detailed significant errors, misstatements, and unsupported conclusions in the education department's preliminary findings. Um, but unsupported it's, conclusions. I would love to see what yeah. they're talking about there. Right. They also said Liberty has made significant advancements in safety since October of 2022. In the last year? Yeah. The last 12 months? Uh-huh. The last 12 calendar months? Even though a lot of these alleged, you know, problems occurred mm. before then. Um, so again, they're going to duke it out. We'll see what happens. I don't know if there's any consequences. There should be. We'll see. Jesus Christ. Let me talk about this. Oh, you're going to hate this guy. Brandon Pritchard. 
course um, I hate him. His name is Brandon there Pritchard. You go. It's the richest name I've ever heard. Yes. Um, so he's a North Dakota uh, Republican lawmaker. Hmm. Um, and basically, he, just this past week, decided, you know what? I'm going to go all in on being the worst kind of Christian I can be. Yay! Like, I'm going to be the most extremist Christian lawmaker in the country. Good That's for him. It seems to be his goal. Set your eyes on the stars. Um, and it's weird because he's always been a conservative Christian. Mm. Uh, but this he's week, doubling he just... Doubling down? Doubling down so hard. Yeah. Here's what he posted last week. All schools should have LGBTQ history taught. And lesson one should be Sodom and Gomorrah. Oof. Yes. Um, this is the same guy who after getting elected last year for the first time, said, if you have pronouns in your bio, you are probably a loser. <laughs> burn. Yeah, burn. Fucking burn. Loser. <laughs> um, it's 1996, and you're a loser, so just deal with that. Guess what? What? This guy was not alive in 1996. How old is he? What? Yeah. How uh, old is Brandon? 1996, so he's, what, 20. 26, 27? 22. Heaven, what are you saying to me right now? I'm saying... He's 22? Yeah. Do you have a picture pulled up? I really want to see what his stupid face looks like. Come look at yes. his stupid face. Just for you, I have the picture right there. Oh, boy. He looks kind of like Matt Gates with less forehead. First of all, that man is 36 years old. <laughs> he is not 22. Are you out of your mind? That is not what a 22-year-old young man looks like. They it, have backwards caps and shaggy hair, Hammond. Listen, and, if, and carry around skateboards. If you're a conservative Christian and you're 22, you always wear suits, even when oh, you're doing like a YouTube so live stream. I'm shocked he doesn't have a bow tie on. So wait, okay, so he's 22 years old. But that's just old. one thing he tweeted. Good. There's more. He goes on to say, here's a simple test to determine if you are conservative. Should the Church of Satan or Satanic Temple be allowed the freedom to worship in the same way as Christians? Yes. If you answer yes, you need to rethink your claimed political identity because you are not conservative. Here's the problem, is that your brain doesn't finish developing until you're like 25 or 26. So my dude is walking around here with a half-baked brain and some dumb ideas. Like, oh, you think you're the first person to think of like, ooh, freedom of religion, even Satan? Like, sir, calm down. Yeah, so freedom also, of religion. North, he's South Dakota, North Dakota? North Dakota. He's all for religious freedom, mm. except for as religion. As long as it's he his religion. As long as it's his religion. By the way, the uh, Twitter account for the First Amendment which is a parody account. Oh, fun. It just like responded with, this would violate me. They do such a good job of mm -hmm. that. This would violate me. This would not violate me. Like if me. religious freedom doesn't extend to all groups, popular or not, yeah. it's religious oppression. Yep. Unless you're a wannabe theocrat. So he goes on to say, every conservative state should put into code that Jesus Christ is king and dedicate their state to him. Force rhinos to say no to Jesus and then brood in, in name, name only. only. Force rhinos to say no to Jesus and then brutalize them in elections. We need a government of Christians, not fakers. I mean, that sounds like a thing a 22-year-old idiot would say. Yes, yes, I agree that if I was 22 and exceptionally dumb, I would agree with him. Yes, this is my favorite one. Oh. The U.S. Senate and House should have a fitness test every year. Very simple. Every member of Congress must do five sit-ups, five push-ups, one pull-up, and submit to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Oh, okay. That sort of took a little right-hand turn on me there. Mm. Um, I have a Which lot is a of weird way of having a no Jews allowed policy, I gotta say, because that is what he is basically saying. No but, Muslim policy, no but, atheist policy. Okay, but I want to back no up. No progressive Christian policy, because they don't count. I want to back up to the physical fitness yeah. test. To, yep. to what end? Um, I think it's a way of getting rid of people. Of he women? <laughs> yeah, probably. I don't know. Like, I'm real fucking yoked right now. I don't know if I could do a pull up. My body no doesn't kidding. work that way. Right. Um, Okay, listen, Hammett, what the fuck? So how, here's the thing. Here's, here's the, the question is, you're the dying fuck? to ask. How did this guy get into office? I mean, and I'm the not answer dying is, to ask. He probably lived in a 
town of 15 people and like was related to eight of them. I wanted to look that up for myself. And here's what I got for you. Like, how does a 22 year old first term Republican lawmaker from it? Bismarck, which is like a larger city there. Yeah, Bismarck's how does this guy around. get elected? And the answer is they the way their district works is the top two finishers in the election get into the state house. There were only two people. <laughs> Uh, on the ballot for that position. So he automatically got there. So then you go back to, well, how did he win the GOP primary, which is also a top two get to make it to the ballot. Uh. Well, there were more than two finishers. Uh, There were more than two candidates in the GOP primary. He was the second place dude, and he beat the next dude by 253 votes. That's his whole family. So, like, these are... Elections where, like, a thousand people are the full electorate. Right. And he got... A few more votes. So there you go. That's how he got there. By the way, my favorite aspect of this is I was digging into this dude because really my question is, who is this dude? What's wrong with him? What is wrong with you, Uh, sir? According to a local paper. Should be sneaking into bars. What has he done since electing office, uh, since getting into office? Tweeted all those things. Don't forget. This is uh, his most visible accomplishment during the regular legislative session earlier this year was a largely toothless ban on drag shows that he promoted as a culture war victory. But in reality, has little real-world impact outside of the undertones of malice it communicated to North Dakota's LGBTQ community. Wow, that was mm. that was editorializing, I think. As it should. <laughs> um, he also claimed he would introduce legislation soon banning state-funded schools from electing gay couples as homecoming kings. Truly the biggest problem every school faces. What? What's the matter with this guy? Like, genuinely, I, <clears throat> I, I, honestly, I see this shit all the time. Some, like, you North know, Dakota uh, State University, it actually elected two homecoming kings, and that's what set him off. He's like, well, if you're getting state money, I'm going to pass a bill next session that says state-funded schools cannot pick homecoming royalty of the same sex. And then he added, but I didn't start the fight. But, like, I see all the time online, you know, a kid... Uh, uh, a trans kid or whatever, a, a boy dressed as a girl or whatever, winning homecoming queen. And the way people are like, this is what they've taken from us. <laughs> like, it's so fucking dramatic. And also, like, maybe take two steps back. And if you think one girl not winning homecoming in one class is like, big bad, then maybe you it's should the same rethink thing as, the role that women play in your society. This cisgender woman didn't win her swimming meet and a trans person won. This is the only thing that matters. Or a because, trans person came in fifth yeah, and she came in eighth. That's right. And they're like, nope, cis women, all of whom are always white, by the way, in those stories, Gotta be. they have a legal right to win any swim meet in high school because everyone cares. Uh, There's another reporter who also pointed out, many Republican lawmakers have been messaging me alarmed by Pritchard's posts. None of them, I would add, did so on the record. Who is saying this? This is the reporter who covers this stuff. He's like, yeah, the Republicans are like, what the fuck's up with this kid? Uh But none of them offered their names. Uh, One one lawmaker who did use his name said he's for it. He's supportive of all these tweets. Um, but, but this Literally. is this is from Rob Port, who is a reporter who covers this dude and and has covered him for a while. He reached out to Pritchard for comment, and this is hilarious. This is from Rob Port, the reporter. Okay. Weirdly, he only replied by sending me a screenshot of his phone screen showing my incoming call. He didn't respond in any other way. I'm not sure what his intent was in sending that to me. That's not how you big time somebody. I know, hold on. Maybe he was rubbing the fact that he's not answering my call in my face. Mm-hmm. It's plausible, but I think he was maybe excited that I was calling and was eager to text the evidence to some confidant, gleeful that his hateful social media Jeremiah was getting some news media attention, only he sent it to me by mistake. And then later... That's a pretty big leap. Maybe. Pritchard texted the reporter an hour later. Sorry, Mr. Call. I'll probably decline a comment right now. If you do write an article, though, I do have a bingo card ready to go. I don't know. Like, what? That you're going to say that I'm a part-time student? Yeah. Yeah. Shameless. Um, And then, wait. This same reporter has reported in the past... Pritchard may not live in the district he represents. Oh, fun. And also, when he was running for office, he said he was an undergraduate student of the University of Minnesota's Law School and School of Public Policy on a part-time and virtual basis. 
nothing wrong with that. You can go to school in nearby Minnesota, mm-hmm. even if you live in North Dakota. That's mm-hmm. fine. But the thing is, that school, the law school, does not offer part-time admission. Oh. And virtual classes are like on a case-by-case basis. Like you're sick and you can't attend anymore. We'll work so with you. So it's not an online university. It's not University of Phoenix. That's right. It's not. And so there, there's no evidence this guy goes to their school right now. So why is he saying he attends their law school God. at all? Why do and, they tell such provable lies? Yeah. And before that, he once said in a separate article, yeah. he's quadruple majoring, which there's no evidence he completed that. In what? Um, there was a list and it was standard stuff, but also it's like, no, you're not. It's like psychology and sociology. Whoa, how'd you pull that off? But he, but he's not doing that. It doesn't seem like. It doesn't seem like he was in class. But he's 22. Like, does he have a college degree? I don't know anymore. Um, he also, at the time when he said he was quadruple majoring, there was no mention of the law school, which seems yeah, very weird. Yeah, I was going to say, he said he's, okay, maybe I don't know how law schools work, but can you be an undergrad at a law school? Like, no, but don't you're you... applying when you're going to law school. You're applying as an undergrad to get into law school, but if you're going to law school, even you, as a part-time student, University of Minnesota ha- doesn't have a part-time law program. But also, like, if you are in law school, you have a bachelor's, right? Yeah. And does he? I would assume he graduated from undergrad somewhere, but I, I don't know but what his degree know. is. But that doesn't even matter. The matter question is like, are you lying? Why are you he's lying? lying? He's a lying liar who but lies about things. He's a Republican, yes. Because he there's no consequences for these lies. That's the thing we all need to like yeah. understand is we these people lie and lie and lie and there's no consequences. So why would they be incentivized to stop? Uh, FFRF's action fund, the lobbying arm of that group, said to him in a letter, you have shown that you are unfit for this responsibility of being a public official. Mm -hmm. You owe an apology to all non-Christian and non-religious citizens of your district or you should resign. Mm. And he responded to that one. Oh boy. And he said, I will not listen to a godless out-of-state interest group like Freedom From Religion Foundation. I will say it again. Christ is King and Lord. Let's dedicate our government to him, his moral teachings, and his mercy. All God's followers say amen. So he's now speaking for all God's followers. Um, But also, I never understand the uh, out-of-state attack. It's like, yeah, buddy, they're in Wisconsin. One, it's not far from you. And two, oh, would you listen to them if they were based in North Dakota? No, No, you wouldn't. it's just distancing language. Yeah, it's It's, pointless. It's so stupid. Um, If he ever studied history or law, though, which he says he has, but clearly he hasn't, maybe he would understand how uh, batshit crazy he is. I got one last story for you only because I don't want to pull this off. I don't want to put this one off for next week. Oh, okay. But uh, this one involved the Archdiocese of Baltimore. Mm. Um, Back in April, back in April, the Maryland legislature passed a bill eliminating the statute of limitations for victims of child sexual abuse. It did have a cap on how much money a survivor could receive based on if they were suing a public institution, a private one, an individual. Don't love that. But... It was finally an opening for people who had suffered child sex abuse mm. decades earlier, uh, as we've seen in many states. Does like, Baltimore have a significant Catholic? Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. And so for people who suffered as a child, but maybe they only came to terms with the abuse later in life, yeah, of but then they couldn't sue because it happened such a long time ago. In Maryland, like other states, they were saying, okay, well, our new bill says we don't care when it happened. Mm. If it happened, you can file a lawsuit over it. That law is That's set right. to go into effect. On October 1st. My birthday. There you go. So how did how did the Catholic Archdiocese of Baltimore respond the day before? They declared bankruptcy. Wow. Yep. What does that mean? Yeah. So they announced that they had filed for Chapter 11 reorganization, which allows certain parts of the church to continue functioning, but it limits the damages the Archdiocese could inevitably face. It also puts an expiration date on when people can sue them for damages which basically nullifies that aspect of the new law. Yeah, but they're also still worried about a guy who died 2,000 years ago, so I guess I'm confused why a statute of limitations should yeah. matter to the Catholics. Yes. Uh, basically, Chapter 11 reorganization, the Archdiocese said, it's the best path forward to compensate equitably all victim survivors. Staggering legal fees and large settlements or jury awards for a few victim survivors would have depleted our financial resources. Yeah, leaving that's the, vast, the point, dog. Leaving the vast majority of victim survivors without compensation. Oh, is that what you're concerned that, about, that is sir? Their concern. You're really worried about the rest of the survivors that you allowed to be yep. put in danger over like and over? 
basically, if so they brave. declare bankruptcy and new people file lawsuits against them, there is going to be an expiration date, at which point they can't do that anymore. And because it's in bankruptcy, the courts can say, okay, we're trying to accommodate everybody here so you all get a piece of the pie, but you can't get more than that. Whereas if they did not declare bankruptcy... As people sued, they would be on the hook for all these uh, settlements or whatever yeah, they that's are. the point of a lawsuit. Um, it also means, this is according to the Washington Post, it could limit damages for some survivors, yes. Some experts say it could more equitably distribute the archdiocese's assets mm. and offer anonymity and streamline financial awards, which may be helpful to some Maybe, but I don't accusers. think that's the church's call to make. Yeah, but it also means... No subpoenas, mm. no public testimony before a jury, which means no transparency, mm. and a lot of victims don't want that. I see. Um, more importantly, it sets a deadline for creditors, including them, to file a claim. So what happens, this is according to uh, a critic of the Catholic Church, what if you can't face it yet? What if you haven't come to terms with your abuse? What if you're far away and you don't know that Maryland has changed its laws? Mm. Like, there is an argument to be made that some victims might benefit from the archdiocese declaring bankruptcy, especially if they haven't yet filed a lawsuit or if they don't have necessarily an airtight case. Right. The individuals who sue the church earlier, they would receive giant payouts as it stands, and that would be fewer assets down the line for anybody else. That's what the church is saying. We don't want to do that. We want to help the upcoming well, sounds like victims. you're going to have to sell a couple fucking churches um, to cover your bills, my dude. That's the point of this. Yeah, but you also, are not the victim here, church. You are the perpetrator, and you are being punished as such. But Maryland's law, the one that they just passed, they capped rewards for victims at $1.5 million. Like, the church had plenty of runway here before its bank account went to zero. And the survivors who are waiting for their day in court or to speak in front of a jury and mm. get this out of their system, which they've been waiting for their whole lives, they're the ones who now stand to lose the most. But now, because they declared bankruptcy, the church can just keep taking in donor money and use it for other activities. And Cardinal Timothy Dolan in New York City, uh, he did this years ago, he just moved money from the victim fund to the you-can't-touch-this-part-of-the-Catholic-church fund mm. bef uh, before they came after uh, their church and there. And they still think that they have the moral high ground. Oh, of course. Like, this guy literally took money out of the hands of victims to keep it for more gold thrones or whatever, yeah. and more frocks. And he's like, yeah, just like Jesus would have. Absolutely. Fucking nailed this. The and Pope is going to give me a special hat. To remind you of how bad this particular archdiocese is, when they offered to publish a list of credibly accused priests back in 2002... That list had 57 names, and it did not include the names of anyone who was already dead. In 2019, in 2019, they released an updated list. This one included the deceased, but it only had 23 more individuals. When the state, when the Office of the Attorney General released their report uh -huh. into uh, the Archdiocese of Baltimore, they found that there were six over 600 victims but the number is likely far higher, unquote. And they were abused by 156 predators working in the Catholic Church since the 1940s. In Baltimore. This is all localized, right? This isn't, this is all in one city that this all happened. Yeah, in the wider Bar Baltimore yeah. Archdiocese. Like, the state found a lot more predators in the church, and those names were not on the church's own list of predators. Do you think there's ever going to be, like, forget the term, a come to Jesus moment about... In the church? No, um, more of like the country's reckoning with how the church is handling these, th like larger, if it hasn't happened like now, larger I don't know. consequences. And you know what I mean? I, like, I hope how the can people exodus, watch this happening and yeah. um, and be and like, stay. yeah, 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 until they start leaving and until they get comfortable with leaving because their friends are leaving. Yeah. That's the thing. There is an exodus out of the church. Yeah. Um, the Associated Press today, Thursday, they actually just released a report today about what non-religious people look like across the world. Like, what does it mean to be a religious, quote-unquote, nun, N-O-N-E, uh -huh. in Egypt, in Israel, in the United States, mm -hmm. etc.? And part of the thing is, they are leaving the churches because of all the reasons you would guess, the bigotry, the, the bullshit, whatever. But when they leave, hopefully, this is to answer your question, I think if people start leaving then other people will be like, oh, it's okay to do that. Yeah. And then they'll start too. Um, by the way, this bankruptcy doesn't affect the parishes and the church or the schools or the charitable institutions. I'm not sure what that means. Uh, basically, all the stuff you associate with the Catholic Church, uh -huh. typically, that's all fine. 
they will stick around. They're not closing down churches by declaring bankruptcy. Catholic schools will still be open, uh, but everything else you can go after, that's what's going under bankruptcy here. Uh, They're the sixth diocese to file this year. Uh, It's the 36th Catholic diocese or religious order to file for bankruptcy, Chapter 11 bankruptcy, since the 2000s when we first heard about all this. Um, According to the Associated Press, the Baltimore Archdiocese has paid out more than $13.2 million Mm -hmm. to 301 victims since the 1980s. (laughs) Um, And now they're like, oh, shit, the law's going to change and open the door to more lawsuits? Uh, Hold the record. Yep. Bankrupt. Oh, boy. Seriously, it's not too late to leave. If you're a Catholic, why would you still be there? You don't have to. I'm not asking you to become an atheist. Just... Leave don't the give, church. Please don't give them your money because this is where it's going to. Mm-hmm. Like, ima- I understand that that five spot that you're putting in that basket is going to support this kind of yeah, like, your money's defense. Going. You are submitting to a defense attorney. Like, this is all you are doing. So, congrats yeah. on that. Maybe Tradition. take your five spot and like go tip a bartender or yeah. a server. Tradition or a is not an excuse to prop up a criminal enterprise. It you really, don't have to stay there. Leave. Just leave. Anyway, that's all I got for now. Oh, Where good. do we find you? And again, we have a party on Saturday for anyone yeah. in the Chicagoland area or willing to drive there at Solemn Oath yes. Brewery in Naperville. Yeah, it's about, I don't know, 20 miles west of Chicago, that's I'd right. say. Details are in the show notes. It's mm-hmm. on Facebook uh, under this podcast Facebook mm-hmm. page. Oh, the B- there's a BNSF train, like a metro train that goes pretty close so if you are not a driving person that yeah. could be come on down let us know if you have questions uh you can find me at uh patreon or you can find us at patreon.com slash friendly atheist podcast next time we have an episode it'll be episode 500 that's Fun. so wild and where do we find you do we have any reviews all that good stuff um yeah you can find me i don't know on facebook or whatever but uh, or you can whatever. Uh, <laughs> i mean i'm j- again not on twitter i don't know how to tell you people where to find me just yeah it's true it's just harder. show up oh also i wanted to say hi to um angie who joined me and leslie on a ghost tour of Louisville, nice. which I will talk about in the bonus episode. You can always leave a review on iTunes. This is from Dan Mancini, or Mancini, uh, my favorite weekly feminist horror po. They, ah. they cut off the titles. Podcast, but of they cut it off. Of course it's podcast, yeah, I, mean, I, I was doing you. a little bit. I see it. This weekly art pro- <laughs> This weekly art project is a brilliant deconstruction of modern society and patriarchy. A male friend goes over to his female friend's house and reads her horrible nightmare stories while she drinks wine. Drinking Dr. Pepper today, my dude. It is 2 p.m. <laughs> this drives the female friend to the brink of madness each week. We get to see her barely survive only to see people accuse her of talking too much. <laughs> it's an ingenious and clever addition to the horror genre that will have you filled with dread and horror while still being very entertained. High concept, but worth it. Five I love stars. It. Happy That's a great 500. review. Thank you. Dan, that was an all-timer. Mm-hmm. That cracked my shit up. I did not even... I just... It was beautiful, the first one beautiful. on the list. Outstanding. All right. Um, we... Well, well, we're doing a bonus episode. We'll do a bonus. What are um, we talking about? I was just down in Southern Kentucky and Louisville uh, for my birthday visiting um, my very uh, dear friend. So um, we went to something called a Moonbow, which is one of Moonbow. the only places that um, when the moon is right, a waterfall waterfall at night will cause a rainbow. And it was really interesting and cool. Um, so I'll probably just be talking about my trip. All right. And I'll talk about my trip, too. All right. Oh, we'll yeah. see you soon. See Bye. you Saturday.